In the year 323 B.C., Alexander the Great died. Alexander the Great was a Macedonian. He created the largest empire the world had yet seen, stretching from Macedonia, Greece, all the way to India. But he died in 323 B.C. at the young age of 33, leaving no heirs. And the result was that his generals began to fight over who would rule the great empire of Alexander the Great. And what happened was that the empire was split. Four of the generals uh, uh, had priority or or emerged in the place of power. And one of those generals' name was Seleucus. And Seleucus possessed the part of Alexander's empire from the eastern shore of the Mediterranean all the way to India. And it came to be known as the Seleucid Empire. And so when Seleucus was deciding on his capital city for his new empire, this was around 300 B.C., he decided to build a city, to build a capital. And he would place it in a strategic location near the northeastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea at the intersection not only of trade routes but of continents. And he would name it after his father, Antiochus. And so he did. And he built the city on the Orientes River, 15 miles inland from the shore of the Mediterranean, and he called it Antioch. Now, when Seleucus Seleucus was building this city, he knew it would become a great city. He knew people from all over that part of the world would move there because it would be his capital city, that it would be a diverse city, and that the population would explode, and that is exactly what happened. So that within two or three hundred years, by the time the Romans had uh, pushed aside the Greeks and had taken control of this part of the world, it came to be, Antioch came to be the second largest city of the Roman Empire, second only to, can you guess what was the largest city of the Roman Empire? Rome, that's it, great job, middle service, they didn't get it, they didn't get it, uh, second only to Rome, which had about a million people, Antioch had half a million people living there, half a million, 500,000 people living in Antioch. And there were Greeks there, and there were Romans there, and Indians, and Persians, and Arabs, and Africans. And among the diverse people groups that moved there, there were also Jews, about 25,000 of them. So a significant population of Jews moved into Antioch. Now they knew the city would be diverse, And so they also knew that people from diverse cultural backgrounds tend to not to get along. And so at some point in their history, some point early on in Antioch's story, they decided to build walls within the city to separate the different people groups, the different ethnicities, because that's the way it is in any major city. Even today, you go to somewhere like New York, you got Chinatown, you got a place where there's the Irish section, where the Italian, people who came from different sections, maybe it was a long time ago, but they settled in a particular area, and that's the way it was in Antioch. And to be able to keep the city at peace, those who ruled the city, those in charge, decided at some place to build walls to separate them from one another. But there was something different about the Jewish people, okay? Whereas generally they practiced what was called syncretism, which was something that um, Alexander the Great practiced across his vast empire. So many different people ruled by one empire, so many different religious beliefs. And so they practiced syncretism where basically different people sort of adopt the different belief systems of other people. They kind of all mesh and mingle together. There's generally a sense of tolerance and inclusiveness that basically it's all the same religion anyway. And so you even had like the Buddhist in the eastern part of the empire in what was India adopting some of the Greek customs and beliefs. But there was one people group, one of these groups was very resistant to that, and that was the Jews. They held to their belief in one God, which made them odd. And so there was no surprise that when a sect of Judaism emerged, a group of Jews who were claiming that their Messiah had come and that he was a carpenter from Nazareth in Galilee who had been crucified under Pontius Pilate and was raised from the dead. They were claiming he had raised from the dead. When this sect of Judaism emerged, no shock, it spread to Antioch. And this was especially the case when a persecution 
broke out in Jerusalem. A young man named Stephen was stoned to death. And we're told in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, that there were people who were scattered all over the ancient world and especially in the surrounding regions, Judea, Samaria. And we're told that he said, when those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, they traveled as far as Phoenicia to Cyprus, which was an island in the northeastern Mediterranean. It's still there. It is an island that's there. And to Antioch, this diverse, this city that was the second largest city in the Roman Empire. And it, while it spread there, it was spreading among the Jewish people, as you would expect. That it would be Jewish people who were believing in this claim to be Jewish Messiah. But something different happened in Antioch. Something that may have happened in other places, but it wasn't happening to the extent that it started to happen in Antioch. It says in verse 20, some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks. That is, Greeks is kind of a blanket term that can mean Gentiles of any different background, those who were not of Jewish descent, began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And so the word spreads not only among the Jews, but to this diverse group of Gentiles. And what happens is the church, the Christians, they explode. Verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And so what began to happen was this incredible thing, unbelievable, is that these people who were separated by walls, different ethnicities separated within this great diverse city of Antioch, they began to sneak out from behind the walls in the middle of the night to gather and worship a Jewish Messiah named Jesus. Well, the growth was such that the people in Jerusalem heard about this, the church leaders, and they were excited about this. And so they decided to send one of their own, someone who they trusted, to check it out and to encourage the ministry that was taking place there. And so they sent someone who'd been with them from very early on. He was also from Cyprus, which was not far away from Antioch, so that was convenient. His name was Joseph, but he came to be called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And so Barnabas went to Antioch and saw what was happening there. And as he saw the growth of the Christian movement, as more and more people were coming to believe in Jesus, especially of Gentile background, of diverse ethnic background, he thought of someone who could help him. Someone who he had mentored. Someone whom he had vouched for and believed in when no one else did. Someone who had originally been an enemy to the Christian faith. who was actually there at the stoning, the persecution, the death of Stephen. And he was from a little town called Tarsus, which was just around the corner of the Mediterranean Sea there in southern Asia Minor. And he brought him to Antioch to help. And his name in the Greek would be pronounced Saulus Paulus. You probably would know him by the Hebrew name, which we interpret as Saul. And then he became really famous by going by his Roman name of Paul. Some people think that Saul just decided, you know, just to drop a letter and change a letter of his name, kind of like Prince decided to go to just like a symbol. You know, he just changed his name. But no, that's his Roman name. And it just so happens by coincidence that they rhyme. Okay, it just happens by coincidence. Saul becomes known more as Paul. And so Saul with Saul and Barnabas, the movement grows even more. And this diverse city, many in this diverse city come to faith in Jesus. So much so that it's in Antioch that we're told was that was where they were first called Christians. In Acts chapter 11, verse 26, is what it said. They were first called Christians at Antioch. Well, a couple years pass. It's actually two chapters in your Bible. It's probably more about three years. And the church in Antioch has grown to the place 
where those who were considered to be the prophets and the teachers were gathered together, those who were leaders of uh, the early church, that, that particular community of Christians, and they decide to take action, okay? And we're told about this in Acts chapter 13. It says, in the church at Antioch, they were prophets and teachers. And I want you to look at this list, okay? Here they are, okay, the prophets and teachers, the leaders of the church in Antioch. There's Barnabas, who we know, I just told you about. There's Simeon, who's called Niger. Now, Niger is the Latin term that means black or dark. Why do you think Simeon was called dark or black? Perhaps it's a description of the color of his skin. That he was a black man from Africa or perhaps from India. There is Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene was a city on the northern coast of Africa in what is today Libya, near Tripoli, Libya. It would be the nearest modern city to, what, to where Cyrene was in that day. A man from northern Africa. Manaean, who we are told he had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Herod the Tetrarch was Herod Antipas, the man who had put John the Baptist to death. He was the son of Herod the Great. The guy who you remember the wise men came to see after Jesus was born. He had tried to kill Jesus or wanted Jesus killed. Herod the Great who had built the temple. Herod was uh, somewhat of a believer in the Jewish God. He had some Jewish background, but he was Idumean by ethnicity, which perhaps the closest thing that we could relate being Idumean would be to say that he was Arab. Okay, that was perhaps the closest ethnicity to describe Herod the Great. So perhaps... Manaean may have been Idumean or Arab like Herod the Tetrarch or had that kind of ethnic, ethnic background. But it's generally widely circulated and told that Herod the Great or Herod Antipas was raised in Rome. And so it could be that Manaean was from the same family or perhaps he was a slave in the household or whatever. He could have been a Roman who grew up with Herod Antipas. And, of course, Saul, who comes to be called Paul. So here you have in this group, you have a picture of the diversity of Antioch. Here they are. You have a Jew from Tarsus, a Jew from Cyprus, both of whom are kind of in, in East Asia. You have Menaean, who may have been a European you have Niger, or you have Simeon called Niger, who could have been an African or perhaps an Indian, Lucius of Cyrene, who was from Africa. Here is a picture of the diversity of the early church. <laughs> and it's the midst of this environment where the gospel is growing, and in the midst of this, uh, in this particular place that they are seeking God. We're told in Acts chapter, uh, in verse 2, it said, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so that the Holy Spirit speaks to them while they are worshiping and fasting. And they, what is in verse 3, it says that um, they, after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And so they send Paul and Barnabas off on what will be their first missionary journey to share the good news of Jesus in Asia Minor. And of course, you know, Paul is eventually going to go into Greece and eventually all the way to, to Rome to share the good news. These journeys of Paul changed the world. And it started at Antioch. In this place to which this, this diverse cosmopolitan city that was really known for its being a place of sexual immorality. That's what it was known. It was a diverse city. It's gone from being a place where they were being sent missionaries to, to now sending missionaries out. And it changed in just three years. And Antioch becomes a hub for Paul, a home base for him. 
where he bases all the rest of his missionary journey. Antioch was as important in the early Christian movement as Jerusalem, but probably most of you had never heard that story before. You never heard about Antioch. You see, the world that they lived in, the New Testament world, Paul's world, was a world that was increasingly urbanized and pluralistic. Okay, those are two big words. But what that means, urbanized, means that people were moving out of rural areas and they were moving into cities. More and more people were living in cities. Less people were living in the country and more of them were congregating in cities. Cities like Rome that were growing to over a million people. Antioch had half a million. Alexandria in Egypt had about half a million. Jerusalem was growing. There were other major cities. Cyrene, there were other cities across the Mediterranean that were growing And their world was pluralistic in that generally people had a lot of different beliefs. You could kind of believe whatever you want to believe as long as you bow the knee to Caesar and you worship Caesar, recognize the authority and divinity of Caesar. We don't care what else you believe. That's generally the way that the Romans ruled. They were very tolerant of different religious systems. And the early Christians were different, okay? They were like the Jews in that they believed in one God, okay, and the Jews had some problems with the Romans, but the Christians were different because they had this strange belief about Jesus, and they were also aggressive in sharing the good news, and it was spreading among Gentiles, among Greeks, among those who weren't necessarily of the Jewish ethnicity. And they had different ethical values. Their ethics were different than those of the traditional Roman culture. They had a different perspective on life and the value of every life, from the unborn to the newborn child, to the sick, to those who were poor, to women. To, they were all valued by the Christian community. They had a different moral ethic when it came to sexuality. They didn't practice or didn't believe in retribution and violence. They supported one another. They believed in forgiveness, reconciliation. And all of this made them weird to the surrounding people. In fact, some believed that they were exclusive. They were intolerant. In fact, the Romans referred to them as atheists because they were so weird. They didn't believe in a literal God, a God that you could hold with your own hands or touch or see. The culture was different from and even maybe hostile to the Christian's belief system, okay? Can anybody relate to that at all in any kind of way? (laughs) Their world was increasingly urbanized and pluralistic. Our world is increasingly urbanized and pluralistic. People are moving more. The cities are growing in America. Generally, the rural areas are not. People are moving more into in the cities and towns, and pluralism is definitely on the rise. And it was in this environment, okay, where the gospel, the good news of Jesus, thrived. Now, today in our world, um, we, uh, this, this kind of change, the change that's happening in our culture is scary to some people, okay? Some people are unsettled by the way that they see the changes that are happening But uh, the truth is that the United States has more Christians than any other nation in the world, okay, by a long shot. And those who do such estimates on things say that within 30 years, by the year 2050, hard to believe that 2050 is only 30 years away, it's not that long, but uh, that the United States will still have the most Christians of any country in the world, but there will be other nations like uh, Nigeria, like Brazil, that are going to be gaining, getting close to the United States. And the reason for that is because of believe because of most of the people who are coming into our country, most of them are coming from Christian countries, not all, but, uh, but that generally in the United States, especially white males are abandoning Christian faith at a faster rate than any other population group, okay? There's your largest mission field in the United States. Right now, the United States sends out more missionaries than any other country in the world, again, by a long shot. And the prediction is is that within 30 years, by the year 2050, we will still send out more missionaries than any other country. But close on our hills is China, of all places. China is becoming 
a hotbed of missions of Christians who are going out into the world. And in China, the official state religion is atheism. I mean, it's, it's actually, they, they, sharing your faith is, is actually illegal in some parts of China. People are being arrested and put in jail for that. And so what we're seeing is a dramatic shift, whereas 100 years ago, the typical Christian was a Western European male. Today, the typical Christian in the world is an African woman. We see Christianity exploding in the global south, in Latin America, in Africa, in China, in Korea, and on the decline generally in the West. Change is happening. In fact, what's happening is that Christianity is the beginning to reflect the diversity of the world. Just like is the case in Antioch. And what is happening is that those places to which we're originally being sent to, or places where we were sending missionaries to places, Africa, China, these places. Now they're sending missionaries to us. And the reason for this is because in the DNA of Christianity, in the spiritual DNA of a Christian is multiplication. When you receive the good news of Jesus, you pass it on. I mean, that's what it is. It's news. That's what the word gospel means. And Jesus said this. He said in Matthew chapter 28, this is our theme verse for this series, and his closing, his departing words to his disciples. He tells them, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go. And what happens is, is as we go, as we obey that call to go, to share, to send, we grow. Not just the church, not just the community of Christians, but we ourselves, we grow. When I went to college, um, I uh, didn't, campus ministry was not one of the top things on my priority list, okay? I grew up United Methodist, and so I got an invitation to attend the uh, Wesley Foundation at Auburn, which is the Methodist campus ministry, and I went maybe once or twice. Maybe I didn't even go once. You know, I just, that just wasn't even my, I wasn't interested in that. I did have some friends that invited me to go to Campus Crusade meetings, and I went to one, and um, I just thought these were the weirdest people, okay? They really seemed like they really loved Jesus. They got excited about singing guitar songs. I've never done that before or seen that before. I thought, these are just weird people. Let me never come back again. And so I, I didn't go back until a couple years later there was a girl that I was interested in who was attending, and so I all of a sudden got real interested in going back again. And, and so I, I started going, and she eventually stopped going, but I kept going. And, um, and what these, these, this, this ministry, they were serious about going, about obeying that call to go into all the world. And what they did was that they challenged college students. These people, uh, we were in a, a phase of life, we're thinking about what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And you can think that you can spend the rest of your life trying to make money, advance in your company or whatever to get to some place of, that was the world defined as success. Or you can invest in making a difference in what matters for eternity. And what they did was they challenged college students to go on mission trips. And I'm not talking about mission trip for like a week or two weeks, which that's great. We've got a lot of business. But to take their whole summer and go to California and work, in the, in, work along the beach of California and share the gospel with people there. Or to go to East Asia. Like They wouldn't even tell us what country it was, although we kind of always do, because we weren't supposed to go there. It's like if they knew we were coming, they might present, because it's, it's like it's illegal, which was kind of cool, which made it kind of like we're James Bond, you know, going. But so these college students, literally to go somewhere where you, it's secretive, you have to raise money, people who are going to support you, and take your whole summer to go. And like, out of 700, 800 students who were attending that meeting, like we had like 30 who were going. And man, serious about it. The challenge was you can spend your life where there's a church on every corner and everybody says they know Jesus, or you can go to somewhere where people have never heard of Jesus. They don't know anything about Jesus. How are you going to spend your life? And for me, and then the challenge was even some to spend a whole year, to take a whole year after you graduate or even in college, to spend it in what they called stint, student international in these placements where they would share the gospel with people all in different parts of the world. 
Now, for me, I, I didn't feel called to be a missionary. And, and when I went to my parents and said, I want to go to East Asia for a summer, they're like, no, you're not. You're not doing that, okay? And one of the main reasons why I wanted to go, because there was another pretty girl who was going to that. You know, it just seems like that's just kind of my story, you know? And, uh, and so I didn't get to go to that. But you know what I did say? I was like, you know, I don't feel called, I don't feel called to really want to go to be a missionary, but what can I do where I am? How can I serve God here? Because there's plenty of people who don't know Jesus right on this campus at Auburn where I was in school. And I started doing this crazy thing where with me and a couple other people, we would go out in the concourse and we would really literally walk up to people and say, what do you believe you're going to go when you die? I mean, stuff like that. I mean, stuff that totally freaked me out and I was scared to do, but I knew I should do. We went out and had spiritual conversations with people. We were out sharing about Jesus with people. And for you, we're talking about in this church, we're talking about doing a lot of crazy things. We've we got groups that have gone to Zambia. We've got groups that have gone to Ecuador. We've been to North Carolina this summer. We've gone to disaster relief. We've got, we're doing Village Church at Autumnwood in one of the poorest areas of our community going in there. We've got prison ministry. We've got recruiting people to go behind the walls of a prison. We've got Celebrate Recovery. This look, we're looking to try to start messy, all this messy ministry. That's intimidating. Some of, you, some of you are scared to death. You never go behind to pr- go into prison. Okay, to do ministry scares you to death. And maybe your mom and dad say you're not going to do that. You know, I don't know. But you could say, you know, I might not do that, but I can serve in kids' town. I can greet people when they walk through the door. I can help to run slides in the service. I can serve in some way. I can do Something make a difference where I am. Because the truth is, is that not all of us can go. And that's just a fact. I say that as a parent of three kids under four. Okay? It is a fact. We can't all go. Okay? I'm not going to ask you to raise my kids for me. I mean, some of y'all are actually doing that. over, but, But not all of us can go. But some of us go by going... Some of us go by sending. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9. I'm talking about the need, okay? He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. It is plentiful. It is ripe, okay? It is ready. But the workers are few. So here's what you do. Instead of just saying go, he says, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field, starting with asking, with prayer. You see, the harvest in Antioch was plentiful. And so the early church, those leaders, they sent Barnabas. And as that harvest became clearer, Barnabas went and got Saul. And then those Christians in Antioch, they looked out and they saw a whole world that could be receptive to the gospel, an entire people group, the the Greeks, the Gentiles. They saw that need, and they prayed, and they went. Well, in America today, there is a harvest. There is a harvest such that other nations are sending people here. In Redland, Alabama, in Elmore County, yes, there is a harvest. There are people who don't know Jesus here. So what are you going to do? Sometimes the question is not just where are you going, but whom are you sending? And whom are you investing in to further what has been handed off to you? Just like those in Antioch had received the message of Jesus, they passed it on. They gave. They shared. They sent. And this is why that you can't have church, you don't have church in the deer stand on Sunday morning, okay? You don't have church in the, in the, in the, on the golf course, okay, on the, in the driving range, on the boat, or the, at the beach, whatever it is. This is why it has to be lived out in community because you, when you are together, you invest in other people, the work is multiplied. Who are you going to send if you're not investing in the lives of other people? Life is lived in this Christian life is in community. We have others who are sent to us. 
we send others out. But it starts with prayer. It starts with asking. The harvest is plentiful, therefore pray. Ask the Lord of the harvest. The church in Antioch, it said that they fasted and prayed and they laid hands and they sent off Barnabas and Saul. And so that's what we're going to do here at Mulder. We're going to pray for 40 days. We're going to set aside a time for prayer as a church. As we discern what God is calling us to do. What is the Holy Spirit saying to us? Now we're already doing a lot. And we've already got some new things on the, in, the, in the works. But what is God saying to us? And so we're setting aside 40 days. And we've got a devotion up here. Devotion and prayer guide that we've made copies of. We've made copies for everybody to take. And what I'm going to ask you to do in a minute is come forward and take one of these. And to spend five minutes, okay, maybe some of you can do 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or 20, 30. But to spend that in prayer, beginning with a place of reflecting on where you are. We're also going to encourage you to fast, too. Fast is where you, you give up a time of eating. Okay, you still drink fluid water, especially, maybe not so much like your energy drink or whatever, or, or uh, Gatorade or Coca-Cola or whatever. But to take a time of, of fasting, and, and I'm going to fast on lunch on, on Thursdays, one meal a week, to take that time to pray, to take that time to, to read Scripture if you can, if you're in a place where you can do that, or maybe there's another meal of the week that would work better for you. But to take time to pray about what God is saying to us at Mulder. Now, for some of you, this whole idea just makes you tired, okay? You're like, I've done enough I've been working my whole life. It's time for somebody else to. I'm retired. Okay, maybe you're not retired, but you are, you are tired of hearing about how we're supposed to be going and sharing Jesus. Maybe you're burned out. You're in a place where you're feeling burned out. Seems like that's kind of where our whole culture is. The fire has moved on to other people, to other parts of the world. Well, let me say this, and I hope you won't take offense at this, but maybe you, you might. If you're in that place and you're feeling burned out, like it's somebody else's job and not yours, maybe it's not because you're tired and you're retired. Okay, again, it's likely not because you're physically spent, but because you're spiritually distant. Because you see, Multiplication is in the DNA of a Christian. It is part of who you are. When you've experienced the love of Jesus, you can't help to want to pass it on. And have you really experienced it if you just want to keep it to yourself? Maybe your heart got broken or you got disappointed and God didn't answer some prayer or something didn't turn out the way that you thought or maybe everything that you were doing, you were doing it for the sake of your marriage or you were doing it for the sake of your kids. You weren't really doing it for Jesus all along. Maybe there was a different God you were serving. And the problem isn't your lack of energy. The problem is, is your distance from God. And your heart not being in the same place as God's heart. Well, where does it start? We restart by examining our own hearts. And that's what we're encouraging you to do with this prayer guide. To get back to a place of examining my own heart. And where I am. And why I need to get to a place of being remotivated about doing what Jesus said that we would do. Because our world is becoming more like the world of the early church, our culture. More diverse, more pluralistic. Generally, the foundation of the beliefs that have, that have formed our society and, and our culture, they're not to be taken for granted anymore. And so what this is, what this brings for us, just like it did for the church of Antioch, is an opportunity. And we want to be the kind of church to where people come, where we invite people to come, okay? 
where they connect with God. But beyond that, we want to be the type of church that serves, that sends people out to share the good news of Jesus. So if you're disillusioned, if you're feeling aimless, like you're lacking a purpose or motivation, I encourage you, let us together decide to get going. To get going in following Jesus.